First off, I want to assure you that it's one of the creepiest things I've ever come across, but it's not really anything that actually happened to me. It's more of an internet rabbit hole I went down one day after reading a really weird Amazon review. And what was intended as a quick online purchase on behalf of my girlfriend ended up with me sitting at my computer for like an hour or so, completely horrified at what I was reading. It all started with a separate but equally horrifying incident in our hometown during the summer of 2018, when a woman was ambushed and assaulted while walking back to her car after work one night. Reading it absolutely terrified my girlfriend, mainly because she worked just across the street from where the incident happened. In the aftermath, we started to discuss methods of personal protection. We discussed everything from self-defense classes to buying a gun, but eventually we settled on purchasing a stun gun for her to keep in her purse. That's how I ended up on Amazon, checking out different tasers and reading the reviews to work out which one was the most effective and user-friendly. As you might know, just above the reviews chart is a little section called Customer Questions and Answers. One of the questions was, and I'm writing this from memory here, how effective is the stun gun? The question was answered by a user named Seth Herder, a name I'd never forgotten, mainly because of how messed up the answer was. This Seth guy claimed that he'd once had some kind of nervous breakdown due to being angry at himself, and had used the taser to shock himself up to 30 times, the number of times being another detail that's just ingrained into my memory. I remember him describing the pain and the marks the taser left behind, as well as how the muscles in his chest or neck felt temporarily paralyzed. But it was the last two lines of the review that really creeped me out. He called it a potent psychological defense weapon on account of the sound it made, which he described as doing something to the dark parts of someone's psychology or psyche or something. I remember thinking, who is this guy? Before recalling that some serial killer that left eBay or Amazon reviews on some of the stuff he'd used to restrain and kill his victims. So, with that morbid curiosity in mind, I plugged the name Seth Herder into Google, and this is the first article that came up. The article was titled, The Samurai Killer of South St. Louis, and detailed how Seth Herder once believed he was the living embodiment of the Antichrist. He also got it into his head that he could somehow control all the world's electricity and that people all over the world wanted to watch him dance. I know that last part seems absolutely insane, but I'm pretty sure it's a deep cut reference to something from the Book of Revelations. In the months before he became a murderer, Seth Herder starved himself to the point where he lost a bunch of weight. He also tied a rope really tight around his waist, painfully tight believing that the pain would somehow increase his satanic powers. There was a part of the article that mentioned how he believed the CIA had implanted a microchip into his head, and how he tried to cut it out before being rushed to urgent care. The doctors kept asking why he'd mutilated himself, but all he seemed interested in was asking if they could perform surgery to remove the non-existent chip. Through reading the article, I learned that the person Seth had murdered was actually his ex-boyfriend. I can't remember the guy's name, although I'm pretty sure all the details are available through various news articles online. But on the day in question, Seth had told him that he needed help getting people out of the walls of his apartment. This obviously greatly concerned his ex, who must have still cared about him enough to actually go over to check on him. And then when he arrived, Herder was waiting with a samurai sword which ended up being the murder weapon. I remember the description of the herder's apartment reminded me of the bad guy from the movie Seven. All this real creepy religious stuff covering the walls, reminding him to pay penance, lists of people he needed to pray for, all kinds of stuff like that. He would sometimes go out into public and dance on street corners, blasting music from a portable speaker that he carried with him. The article said that some believed that this was him just spreading good vibes or whatever, having no idea what a total psycho he really was. The rest of the article talked about some interviews he did while awaiting trial and went into the various mental illnesses he was suffering from which led him to becoming homicidal. I remember this one line which talked about how 
he talked with such clarity about the whole thing, how he realized he was deluded, that it was like someone who'd been scammed talking about how foolish they were to believe the scammer's lies. Only, it wasn't another person making this guy believe that he was the Antichrist or whatever. It was this guy's own brain. Kind of sad in a way, but even more sad for the relatives of the ex he'd murdered. I'm not saying I feel sorry for the guy, not at all. It's just easy to see how they went so far wrong when you realize how horrifically mentally ill they were at the time. The only people I feel really sorry for are the victim and his family, because although the herder guy might just get a second chance at life someday, the man he killed, that's it for him. He really must have cared about the guy to go over to his apartment that day, and Seth Herder repaid him by cutting him up with a freaking samurai sword. I was a pretty and relatively smart 15-year-old girl, a good kid who did well in school despite a tough childhood. I was working in an amusement park full-time during the summer. The area I lived in could be sketchy, but having grown up with little to no adult supervision, I was used to trying to look out for myself. My father was out of town, mother was long out of the picture, and my sister, three years older, and myself were staying at our home alone. I finished work at 11pm when the park closed and walked home by myself as I usually did. It wasn't far, maybe 10 minutes or so. I arrived home, my sister was still out somewhere and I got ready for bed, putting my pajamas on and crawled into bed. I was starting to fall asleep but I heard a small noise. I didn't know what it was but it didn't seem like the usual house noise if you know what I mean. My bedroom was on the second floor with stairs leading up. I didn't hear anything after that noise, didn't investigate, and just chalked it up to nothing. I started to fall back asleep when I heard what sounded like hesitant footsteps on the stairs. I was instantly awake, but in my mind it was my sister coming home and climbing the stairs where her bedroom was. Still in bed, I called out, Wendy? Wendy, is that you? I heard nothing back, and I yelled again, Wendy, is that you? Nothing, but then more footsteps. I was petrified as I tell the story to this day. I don't understand some of the reactions that night, so I really can't explain them. I got out of bed, opened the already ajar bedroom door fully, and went out to the stairs, where I stood at the top. Below me, about halfway up the stairs, was a man I'd never seen before. He looked to be in his early 20s a little taller than my 5'7 stature. Not a big guy, but solid with blonde curly hair. I asked him what he was doing. His reply was a garbled mess, something along the lines of, Where's Wendy? My mother told me not to get mixed up with women. Where's Wendy? From his mannerisms and wild-eyed look, he seemed like he may have been doing drugs. He had followed me home from the park and was asking, where's Wendy in response to me calling out for her. For some reason I got very angry, not just scared, and started screaming at him to get out, get out of the house, that I was going to call my father and Wendy and he needed to just get out. To my surprise, he actually did. He turned around and ran back down the stairs and I didn't see where he went after that, but it turns out that he must have left. I have no idea how he got in, but he was definitely there for me, and that's why he followed me. Not burglary or anything else. He was looking to do God knows what to me. I think the only reason he left was because he had no idea where my sister actually was, thought she was in the house, and it was an added complication possibly getting him caught. I was so shaken that I stayed up for the rest of the night. I didn't call the cops, didn't call a friend. The only person I told was my sister the next day. I'm not quite sure why I reacted that way. All I did was sit in my rocking chair, clutching my cat and rocking and crying, staying awake until the next morning. My sister never did come home that night. She had stayed at a friend's and came home later the next day. This happened almost 35 years ago and I've never told anyone until now.
So this was about three years ago and it still creeps me out. I was 18 years old at the time, I'm a female. I'm now 21 years old and I was walking home from work at the local pizza joint and took my usual route home. It was about 9.45 to 10.15 p.m. and it was super dark. As I'm getting about 100 yards away from the street I live on, a white van turns onto that street and something didn't sit right with me, so I yanked out my earbuds and paused my music. I then turned down my street and as I'm getting closer to my house, I started getting a weird gut feeling. I looked up from my phone as I was about to text my roommate, who was out of town at the time, that I was almost home, about 15 yards or so. As I looked up, I noticed the white van sitting in front of my house, and the man inside is just staring at me, the yellow car light shining on his face. He had brown hair, glasses, and facial hair. His van lights were off, but his car was running. I stopped and put my back to a tree in my neighbor's yard and just stood there, maintaining eye contact with this man. After about what seemed like eternity, probably only about five minutes at minimum, he starts driving towards the stop sign at the end of the road. I didn't put my back to him. I kept my back to the tree and maintained visual on the van the entire time until it stopped at the stop sign. He just sat there for probably two to three minutes, all while I'm not looking away and while my back was still on the tree. Finally, he turned right, the direction in which I had come from, and after about 20 seconds of making sure he or anybody else wasn't coming, I bolt to my house. I quickly get inside and lock the door. I go to the window and very quietly look through the blinds. I didn't turn on any lights because I'm not stupid. After a few seconds of looking, he drove back up and down the street and left again. Afterwards, I texted my roommate what had happened and then went to each and every one of the windows in my house to make sure that they were locked along with the back door and garage door. I made sure to keep all lights off for the remainder of the night. I didn't sleep a lick that night. I was so paranoid at every sound or every movement. And let's just say I never walked home alone after that. For some context, I have been friends with this guy for a little over three years now. When I first met him, I thought he was hilarious, kind, intelligent, and overall a really interesting person. Everyone thought that of him, and they still do. He's loved by his peers and is a very well-known member of our community, and this is important later. We didn't become best friends till a few months into our friendship. One day we were joking around and we had a genuine connection with each other. I've never had such a good time with someone before. It was one of those moments when you're with someone and you suddenly laugh and can't breathe. It was fun. Whenever I first met him, his ex-girlfriend warned me of him. I was pretty close to her, but I still couldn't believe anything she said about him. I assumed that she was just a vengeful ex. She claimed that he went far past her boundaries, was unusually cruel to her at times, and one time attempted to drown her. She said they went swimming and he put all of his weight on top of her and kept holding her under the water. Once she'd come up, he would do it again and again, and they actually broke up after that. I kind of just ignored this. As I said earlier, I just chalked it up to her having an extreme dislike for him. One day, he brags to me about how he got away with relentlessly bullying this kid in high school. He tried to talk him into taking his own life, but the kid would only go as far as to actually cut himself, so... He gave up after getting bored. He thought this was hilarious, and he was laughing while telling me about this. I was very disturbed by hearing this, and I've never seen him act so cruel before. Another time we went hiking together, and this was his idea. The trail we were at was very popular, so there were a lot of people there. This one woman stood out to him, I guess, and he kept commenting on how gorgeous she was. She was with a man who I guess was her husband or boyfriend and I just thought the whole thing was very strange. Afterwards, we went out to eat inside of this plaza and he guided the conversation towards the topic of intimacy, I'll just say that. We each slowly opened up about what we liked and it was pretty normal until he brought up his true interests. He said that he had fantasized about kidnapping, assaulting, and murdering a girl. 
He told me in detail how he basically wanted to torture some lady and then do things to her after she was gone. It was all just really messed up stuff. Once we got done eating, he kept joking about going back to that girl and doing all that to her. He brought it up numerous times throughout the day and it was apparent he wasn't joking. It was more of a suggestion at this point. I had distanced myself from him after that and we kind of drifted apart anyways as we got separate jobs and didn't see each other much. I went to a party one night and guess who was there? Creepo. At the beginning I mentioned how everyone loves him. He is an active member of the community and goes to church, plus his new occupation adds to his facade. He starts talking to me and he seemed normal as per usual. I thought he changed because of how convincing he was. I'm sure you think you could tell, but I'm telling you, this guy could easily fool you. He told me how he joined the local PD. Yeah, he was actually a cop now, and I was shocked by this. He always mentioned wanting to join law enforcement to never say that he had bad intentions. Maybe he was genuine about helping people, or maybe it was just a ruse, who knows. But either way, he shouldn't have that kind of authority. We start talking again, and we hung out a few more times. He seemed completely normal and kind, so I assumed everything was alright, until he mentions his cousin's death and talks about him so coldly and doesn't seem to feel sad about it at all. He also spoke of his current girlfriend in a detached manner. During our friendship, he told me how he abused his dog and killed others when he was younger and recently he bragged about kidnapping an escort and scarring her. Anytime I asked him what he meant by scarring her, he'd become hostile and refuse to go into further detail. He always loved going into detail, so I'm curious about why he isn't about this all of a sudden. On New Year's, we went to a bar and he literally nearly killed a guy. He literally beat the guy till he was choking on his own blood and didn't stop till I said the poor guy could die. I tried to stop him physically, but he's a lot stronger than I am and he turned around with this blank expression on his face and just casually went back into conversation. I've reported him to the police anonymously, but I haven't heard anything back from them, and I'm convinced that this guy's a psychopath, or something very close to it. Back when I was still working in a rehab facility as a social worker for girls who were victims of SA, and this was out of town, I would take a jeepney and a bus as well to get to my workplace. I was an in-house social worker, meaning that I would stay at the facility for five days and then I would get two days off. My shift is Saturday through Wednesday, meaning that I can get back home Wednesday evening and return to the rehab facility Friday evening. I like to travel during evenings since there are not a lot of passengers and I can enjoy my window seat alone. The facility is located in a rural area. I can take a tricycle going there from the bus stop but it's too expensive for me. I would always walk alone and mind you I have to pass through a wide sugarcane field before going there. There's no usual street lights there but I didn't mind except for that one night. Just near the road was a small mom and pop store where I usually buy my snacks. It's about a kilometer away from my workplace. I got close with the owner and she would often offer for her son-in-law to drive me to my workplace. I always politely declined her offer because I don't want to be a burden. That time, she offered again and I took it because when I looked down the road going to my workplace, it was dark and the air felt heavy and just kind of weird. I finished my Pepsi and cigarette and hopped on the back of the motorcycle. When we reached the middle part, there were five to seven drunk men talking in the middle of the road and saw us coming. One guy said, Miss, come down and talk to us. I got scared and he came closer. The son-in-law instantly drove his motorcycle fast and some of the men chased us while calling after me. Thank God they were not able to keep up. If I didn't trust my instincts, I had no idea what would have happened to me that night. It was the early 90s and I was 17 or 18. I had moved out from my parents' house not long before to not the safest of cities. 
I was a handful at the time and clashing heads a lot with my parents. I had a great paying job for my age, it was $16 an hour, and rent was incredibly low at $350 a month, so I moved out. My best friend and I would go for blunt rides around the city when we were bored. Back in the early 90s, the streets were pretty scenic with crackheads and corner boys. I stupidly had very little fear and we were used to it. I was driving and we were both pretty smoked out. She was also drinking some kind of liquor straight from the bottle. We had just gone through a yellow light on one of the main roads when I noticed the car behind us had a police light on the roof and was flashing their headlights at me. Oh crap, I thought. My friend starts freaking out, shoving the bottle under her seat, almost in tears already. I didn't think twice about it. Back then, there were undercover cars everywhere. I pulled to the side of a pretty busy street, hiding the blunt and watching the driver take the light off his roof and start walking towards us. He tells me he had seen us driving up and down the streets looking for drugs and demands our IDs. He's leaning in and close to my face looking back and forth at both of us and sniffing the air. Really big guy, kind of unkempt. We fish out our IDs and hand them to him. He tells us we're in big trouble. And in my rebellious dumb head I'm thinking, for what? We weren't looking for drugs, just joy riding and smoking some weed. And he goes back to his car. By then, my friend is a puddle of tears, and she was no angel either. She was just drunk and high and freaking out. He finally comes back and tells us that he talked to his partner. There was another man in his car, and his partner decided to take it easy on us. He said that he would let us go with a warning if we gave him all of our weed and went home. I remember quickly calculating the situation. Plain clothes, undercover car, just wants our weed. Stuff didn't add up. And just as that moment, an actual police car was driving by on the other side of the street. The guy saw it too and stepped back a little. I just reacted and opened the door and went to the middle of the street waving my arms at the cop car. I remember the look on the guy's face, like a confused kid caught with nowhere to go. The cops were coming to a light and not going fast anyway. They stopped right there and I just started asking them before they could say anything, Is this guy a real cop? They looked confused. The guy looked like he didn't know what to do. I was yelling to the real cops that this guy said that he was a cop and pulled us over. Guy started fast walking back to his car, to his partner. The cops left their car in the middle of the street and went after him, and they did apprehend him. Eventually more cops showed up, and my high is completely gone, and the fake cop car is swarmed. I finally see them both being taken to a cop car in cuffs. The cop that originally stopped came back to my car with our IDs and explained to us that this wasn't the first time these guys had pulled their little fake cop act. Asked me if it was okay to drive home. They took our information and said that they would be in touch. I was shaken, but more mad than anything. We went back to my apartment and that was that. I had a habit of checking out the police logs and court sentencing in the local paper. I found the guy's court appearance which also contained a mugshot and a short article of how many times he had done the same thing to other women. The danger we could have been in didn't really sink into my stupid teenage brain until I read that he had stabbed two of those young women. I still remember his face and his name. The court record said that he got a 20 year sentence. I wasn't a big fan of the police back then but thank god they just so happened to be driving by. I was out one morning, late for school, and decided, hey, I'm already late. What it would hurt to get something to eat. So I stop by McDonald's and go in. It's like 7am and there's nobody in there but this guy and his kid. The man offers to buy me breakfast as, I quote, it's pouring rain and you look like you could talk to someone, unquote. I figured, sure, free meal, why not? So he orders me food and I sit down at the table with him and his kid. I'm not sure if they were a girl or a boy, but they were short and had this big hoodie on. Messy hair, the works. The guy, on the other hand, was a solid six foot five inches, well dressed and super sociable. He sat down and started talking about God and his church and all this other stuff, but the whole time his kid was picking their breakfast burrito apart and staring at me. 
They had marker all over their fingers, like they dipped their hands into ink. It looked like the only thing keeping them awake was just straight terror. The guy excused himself to the bathroom at one point, and his kid slid a piece of paper over to me with what looked like them crudely scribbled on with horns labeled neon and effing garbage. I just left after that. I have no clue how old this kid was, but I'd say maybe 12 or 13. It wasn't horrifying, but the combo of this hobo demon child glaring at me as they ripped up napkins and scribbled creepy drawings and ate their burrito in a demented manner, contrasted by their dad being overly polite and excessively talking about God and bringing people to the light and salvation, made me super uncomfortable and just scared the daylights out of me. I used to work as a bartender at a bar that closed at midnight. My coworker that night was someone that I was friends with and we would often go out for a drink after we had finished closing the bar down. That night we finished around 1am and decided to go to a nearby bar that was open until 2am and was popular amongst service industry people. We enjoyed our drinks then when the bar was closing up and we were paying our tabs, I noticed a male friend of mine who was going through a rough breakup. We ended up sitting outside of the bar on the back of my car and talking. We both had a lot to catch up on and we ended up having a very nice but long conversation. I checked my phone and realized the time was about 3.55 in the morning. This was too late for me so I said goodbye to my friend and we both got into our cars and left. I lived about a half a mile from this bar, only a few blocks so it didn't strike me as too odd when I saw a car driving closely behind me. It was such a short distance that I didn't really notice or think much of it. I pulled up in front of my apartment and got out of my car as the car following me passed, and then sharply U-turned and stopped in front of me. The window rolled down and a man's voice said, Hi, I saw you when you arrived at the bar and I was watching you. You seemed really beautiful and interesting so I decided to wait for you to leave so I could follow you to ask for your number. It slowly dawned on me that he had seen me sometime around 1am when I arrived, then was somehow watching me outside after the bar had closed for the entire two hours I sat out there with my friend. He must have been sitting in his car just watching and waiting for me to leave. You just watched me that entire time and followed me home? You, you can't do that. He started to get out of his car to apologize and convince me, but I yelled that I had my phone and that I had dialed 911. He jumped back in his car and sped away. I waited until I couldn't see him anymore to go inside, so he didn't know which place I lived at. It was so dark I never even saw his face, and honestly I was too scared and shocked to think to try and get his license plate. All I remember was that it was a dark blue or black sedan. I spent the rest of my time living there slightly afraid and looking over my shoulder. I received some strange silent phone calls after that until I eventually moved and changed my number. I also never went back to that bar again. I went to the grocery store today. I entered the first set of doors into the cart area and lobby, grabbed a cart and paused for a man to enter the second set of doors from the lobby to the store. He had no cart and I figured would be moving faster than me. He took a step back insisting, ladies first. I smiled, thanked him and went on my way. While comparing two items in the store I noticed someone approaching in my peripheral vision and when I looked up it was the same man. He stayed several feet away and said, I hope this isn't too forward, but you're very cute. You smiled at the front door and it was just so cute. I blushed and smiled and said, uh, yeah, that's kind of forward, but thank you. He stared at me for a few moments like he expected more, so I smiled, nodded to signify good day, sir, and turned back to my shopping. He walked away and I thought maybe he was just an awkward person, not malicious. I finished shopping, bought my items, and left the store. 
As I was getting closer to my car, I noticed the same man leaning against the cart corral near my parking space. I froze when I saw him and the following dialogue exchange occurred. Uh, may I approach? Uh, have you been waiting here just for me? He smiles. Uh, yes. May I approach? Uh, to be honest, I'm weirded out that you even know where I parked and that you waited near my cart outside. I'd rather you not approach me. Oh, okay, that's why I asked. Uh, sorry for anything I did to make you feel weird. I watched him get into the driver's side of a car nearby before unlocking my trunk to load my groceries. The only way he would have known where I parked is if he had followed me in the store from the parking lot. Knowing that made both encounters in the store seem fabricated and freaky. The most polite creeper encounter I've ever had, but still creepy nonetheless. I went to a gas station to check my wheels and undercarriage for any tracking devices. I didn't find anything, but I'm glad I live with two protective 65 plus pound dogs, just in case. I went to the local craft store today at around 10 a.m., an hour after they opened on a Tuesday, so not a lot of the other customers in the decently large store. I was in an aisle near the back of the store trying to pick out some yarn colors for a few minutes when I suddenly felt a tap on my left shoulder. The woman who tapped me then popped up on my right side and held out a piece of paper. The paper was a lengthy note about being born unable to speak, is pregnant and asking for money. I honestly did not continue to read the rest. I can't even describe the strange vibe this woman gave off as she stood there holding her note with an unsettling grin. I politely declined. I never carry cash anymore. Her grin disappeared like a switch and she just folded up her note and walked away. I quickly left the aisle and went towards the more populated front of the store trying to shake the uneasy feeling from the encounter. I started to browse around in another area and noticed the same woman lingering around the aisle across from me. I moved to another area and she seemed to follow. I then decided to just go find the one thing I actually came to the store to get and leave. While I had stopped to look in that aisle, the woman walked right behind me, paused for a second, then kept walking. At this point, I had had enough. I quickly paid and got out of there. I'm just trying to shake the feeling. Something seemed very off about the situation, from the initial approach to her whole demeanor. I was looking forward to finding crafting supplies I never needed today, but I was more happy to just get home afterwards. As far as I can tell, she did nothing more than creep me out. This was years ago, but another post reminded me about it. I was in my early 30s and ran into Kmart for some random items. I noticed this man in the electronics section. I don't think anything about it until I was buying some underwear and he was in that area too. It was nothing too revealing, just your normal everyday stuff. As I went to check out, I saw him hovering by the door. I told the cashier exactly where I was parked, what I was driving, and that I would go to the grocery store down the street and pull in on the sidewalk in front of the door if he followed me. I asked him to call 911 if he did so. At the time, my dad was a deputy in our county, but he was off duty at the time. I called him on my cell phone as I was pulling out of the parking lot, and sure enough, the guy pulled out behind me. My dad stayed on the phone with me as I did exactly what I told the cashier I was going to do. The guy pulled right behind me on the sidewalk at the grocery store. I was literally shaking and crying. I sat there with my doors locked and my dad on the phone as I heard the sirens. It was just a minute, but it felt like forever. When the police arrived, they yanked him out of his car and questioned him. His story was, we just happened to end up at the same places in the store and went to the same grocery store. Why was he in the woman's underwear section? Anyway, he had some kind of warrant, so... He actually was arrested. It was made clear to him while he was in jail that he was messing with one of their own. In other words, leave a deputy daughter alone. I 
I was a 16-year-old girl and an avid runner. I ran anywhere from 4 to 10 miles a day. I had a few parks I rotated through and decided one day after school and before work to run at this pretty secluded park next to the river. It was a very hot day and I knew this park had a lot of shade. I usually carried a knife or pepper spray with me but forgot it at home and didn't have time to go back before work. Coming in, I noticed a few moms with their kids at the playground and what I believed to be one of the children's grandpas watching the kids play. I love kids, so I always enjoy seeing them. Cut to me running my laps. It was getting closer to dinner time and the families all started to slowly leave. This park was two laps per mile, so I was on the second half of mile three when I noticed all of the moms and kids were gone. I was a little uncomfortable since I believed that I was all alone in this park. Something about when the moms were there comforted me, but now I was alone, or so I thought. I'm nearly finished with mile three when out of the corner of my eye I see the grandpa starting to walk the track coming my way. I'm confused since I believed he was with the kids, but all the kids were gone. I didn't even see another car in the lot besides mine. And to make things even more creepy, he was sucking on a lollipop. Random, but somehow it added to the creep factor. My body is telling me to flee, but I'm a stubborn teenager who was determined to run four miles that day. I figured I would run past him and be able to move on with my run. I mean, it's not like he could outrun me, right? I'm about three steps from him and doing all I can to pretend I don't see him, acting like I'm super focused and can't be bothered. And just as I thought I had made it past him successfully, he somehow grabbed the wires of my headphones and pulled them out of my ears. I turned around at him absolutely livid, but as a woman, I know I have to play nice to try and lessen my chances of being murdered. I just look at him, smile, and say, Are you okay? He takes a long pause, still sucking on that lollipop, then pulls it out and shows me this creepy grin that sends shivers down my spine. He looks me up and down and says, like to play alone, huh? While well, grabbing a piece of my blonde hair that was in the ponytail. I smacked his hand off my hair and sprinted as fast as I think I ever have back to my car. I had a 1994 Saturn that could only be unlocked manually with a key. So like any horror movie, it takes me a ridiculous amount of attempts to get the key in the hole. All the while, I can hear him walking towards me, slow and steady. Finally, after what seemed like hours but was most likely only a few seconds, I unlocked my car and jumped in. I locked the door and soon after the old man was almost in my car. I start the engine and start to back out of my parking lot. I see the man trying to get behind my car but luckily I was fast enough and he wasn't able to. I booked it out of that parking lot and didn't look back. I don't know what his plans were. I don't know why he was watching those children play and I don't know how he kept a lollipop in his mouth so long without it all melting away. I'm just so glad that I didn't stick around to find out. Fast forward to now. I'm 28 years old and have still never returned to that park even though it's the closest park to my house. Hopefully that man is long gone, but I'm not going to go look and see. Imagine you're standing in a sweltering jungle. The hour is early, before dawn. From the blackness of the jungle, you hear a familiar voice calling out to you. What do you do? Listen to this story about a mysterious entity that lurks in the darkness, waiting for just the right person to wander along. This story is based on a post from Reddit, r slash paranormal, from user Eternity Pleasure, entitled don't follow her voice. I'll leave a link in the description to the original post because I completely pretty much rewrote it for the purposes of this story. Hello all. This story is not necessarily my own personal account, but rather something I was told by my father. He and my uncle had this experience when they were kids. It's a bit on the lengthy side, so I'll get right into it. My father and his elder brother, my uncle, were best friends growing up in India during the late 60s. Dad used to live in a very small village called Maharashtra. The village is actually located in the jungle. 
and had a population of under 800 people at the time. It was mostly farmers. There was little to no electricity available. They didn't even have clocks. Folks had to tell time based on the position of the sun. I know it sounds like medieval times, but that was the situation for most tribal people in India. My father, then 8 or 10 years old, and my uncle, then 15 or 16, used to get up early in the morning before sunrise and go out into the jungle to cut wood. The wood they cut would be used for daily needs like cooking, etc. My aunt, their elder sister, would make breakfast for them. They would eat bakri, a kind of Indian bread, and sabji, a type of curry. She would either pack a meal for them so they could eat later, or deliver the food to them while they worked in the jungle. The area where they chopped their wood was very familiar to them, so they never had a hard time finding each other out there, even in the early light. My grandfather, their father obviously, would always be out getting the farming work started. They would have their breakfast together and then come back with the logs from the jungle. One day, during the winter, my uncle and father got up early in the morning as usual. It was still dark because the sun rises a bit later in the winter season. My aunt was still sleeping so they decided not to disturb her. They picked up their axes and went into the jungle. That day, for some reason, they decided to go a bit further than usual, deeper into the jungle. They went so far that before they realized it, they were unable to see the lantern lights of the village. Not wanting to waste the trip, they decided to get at least one tree down and gather what they could. After a while, my uncle noticed something suspicious. He wondered why the sun had not risen yet, even though they had been in the jungle for a couple of hours. Just by instinct, he knew that by that time, there should have been birds singing and roosters crowing, all the typical signs of the morning. However, there was no noise, no cattle mooing, no dogs barking alongside their shepherds. All there was in the air was an eerie, profound silence. The two decided to hurry up with their work and try to get out of there sooner rather than later. Now, before going on any further, let me be very clear about my uncle. He's a very tough guy. Nothing scares the dude easily. He's well respected by the whole village, to this day. Same goes for my father. But in that moment, something was different. He didn't know why, but he was feeling like there was something very wrong. Perhaps like something was watching them from deep inside the jungle. My uncle somehow knew it was not a tiger, a cheetah, jaguar, or a wild boar. I guess he had felt the presence of those things before, and this was not it. All of a sudden, my father and uncle both heard the voice of my aunt. She sounded distant, like she was searching for them from afar. They couldn't see her, they just heard her voice, clear as day. My uncle was immediately suspicious because the voice was coming from deep in the jungle not from the direction of the village. He told my father to tell her to come to them. When he did so, the call stopped for a moment, and then she replied, No, you come to me. Hurry. I've brought you your favorite food. At that moment, my uncle realized what they were dealing with. He had heard stories from the other villagers about a voice which leads people away into the depths of the jungle, sometimes never to be found again. In cases where the lost people did return to the village, they were often afflicted by an extremely disturbed and even destroyed mental state. The voice was said to belong to a paranormal entity called a chakva, a supernatural being who has the ability to hypnotically lull you into a vulnerable mental state, even so far as to make you harm your own body. As my uncle thought about this, putting it all together in his head, he suddenly realized something else. Being a naive eight-year-old boy, my dad had begun walking toward the sound of his sister's voice. He started to call out to her, replying. The voice began calling his name, yelling, Come, this way. I am waiting here with your breakfast. My uncle ran towards my father at full speed and grabbed him by his shirt collar. He said, Don't listen to her. Come on, we must go home. My father replied, but it's our sister, she's calling us and I'm hungry. By that time, my uncle had already grabbed my father's hand and told him, she's bluffing with us, she has no food, now come on. My father was about to start arguing with my uncle, but then he noticed his older brother's hand was shaking. 
He looked into my uncle's eyes and for the first time in his life, he saw true fear in them. They walked the rest of the way back to the village as fast as they could, without another word. As they got closer to the village, they heard the mysterious voice again. Why are you going that way? Come here, follow my voice, she said. My uncle, still holding my father's hand, said, Ignore her. Needless to say, he was trying to divert my father's attention and play it cool so he wouldn't panic. Their long walk back to the village felt like an eternity. Now, being a Hindu by religion, my uncle started mumbling mantras of Lord Rama. The voice slowly started to fade away as they got closer to the village. My uncle took a long sigh of relief when he finally heard the sound of dogs barking from the direction of the village. He saw the light from the lanterns and knew that they were getting close. He said it looked like all the dogs in the village had gathered together and started making loud crying noises like wolves. Concerned that the entity might have still been following them, the two ran the rest of the way to the village. They stopped by our ancestral temple, joined hands and bowed their heads, saying thank you. Once they reached home, my uncle and father saw that my aunt was still in her bed. I suppose my father was still confused about what had happened because he badmouthed her for beating them in a race back to the house. They later found out that they got mixed up and left the house way too early, as in around 2 a.m. or maybe even earlier. To make things worse, it happened to also be a moonless night. And that's it. My dad and uncle talk about this story often, so I figure I would pass it on. Thanks for listening. Thanks so much, friends. Click that notification to be alerted of all future narrations. I release new videos every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r slash let's read official, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations and bonus content over on Patreon, or click that big join button to hear about the extra perks offered for the channel. And check out the Let's Read podcast where you can hear all of these stories in big compilations and save huge on data, located anywhere you listen to podcasts. Links in the description below. Thanks so much, friends. And remember, don't let your meat loaf.